This film will document the division between the football club and the community that has been implemented by Venki ownership. First stop, a prime example of the communication problems that Venkis have caused early into their reign. So Wayne, how long have the uh, WEC group sponsored the Darwin End stand at Blackburn Rovers? We've been sponsoring the club through the Darwin End sponsorship since 2008 was our first season. How has your communication uh, with the club been since you've started sponsoring the stand? Um, obviously we've built up a very good relationship, mainly through the commercial team down at Blackburn Rovers. Um, we have a lot of corporate hospitality. We've taken a lot of clients down to the game and used their facilities and uh, advertise them as a, as a main stand sponsor on our websites, etc. That was an exceptionally good relationship over the past two to three years. Since the new owners have came in, we've still got certain uh, connections down at the club in the corporate uh, facilities, but we don't have any contact with the owners whatsoever. So the relationship really has been affected since the Venkis have come in? Absolutely. Uh, I wrote a letter to him back in October last year. I realised things were going uh, seriously wrong. Uh, we could predict that there could be some uh, serious consequences for the supporters and the employees of Blackburn Rovers. So I wrote them a very detailed and long letter. I was promised that I would get a response to it. Every second day I was getting a reply back from the club saying there was about to reply to me. Uh, seven weeks later I still haven't had a reply. The letter was really 50% as sponsor of the uh, football club and 50% as a lifetime supporter. After seven weeks I didn't get a reply so I informed the club that I'd release it and I released it to the local newspaper. They ran that as a main story and then from that I started getting contact from all over the world. Um, people also disillusioned with what was going on with the club. And that led to some of the current founder members of the Blackburn Rovers Supporters Investment Trust um, setting up the trust and coming up with a new issue, a uh, new proposal. So, what was your main reasoning behind setting up the trust and how has it progressed so far? Well, we set it up basically to try and uh, set up a, a medium where we could put forward uh, a proposal for the community to buy Blackburn Rovers. I know it seems a bit far-fetched and uh, difficult uh, task to achieve but we're very confident that we could raise enough money through supporter pledges and supporter um, input into the club we will be able to buy the club outright and keep it as a, a fully community owned football club in which case all the decisions will be made locally and no major decision or major uh, sale of the club could happen without the supporters agreeing to do so. And you think that's very important in terms of a step forward to what's happening at the moment? Yeah, obviously we set up this, uh, the, the commencement of it was October last year, officially it was set up in February of, of this year, but since then you've seen how the likes of Glasgow Rangers has gone into administration, so even the most famous clubs in the world can have serious problems, and as a community owned club, it can never be down to individual owners to make major decisions on what a football club does or doesn't do. Is it important for you that the Venkis leave Blackburn or can they rectify themselves? We've been trying for a long time to get them to come out and communicate with the fans. Uh, we have some big high profile supporters of the Trust. We have the four local MPs, which include Jack Straw, ex Home and Foreign Secretary. We've got a lot of local business leaders, a lot of local community leaders, leader of the Blackburn and Darwin Town Council. So we've we've held out an olive branch many times to them to come and talk to us. You know, we could we can be the umbrella and the link and the conduit between the two parties to help them re-enact re and re-engage with the supporters. But as yet, I've still not even had a reply. Myself and Jack offered to go out to uh, India to speak to the owners direct at our own expense. and We've still not had a reply to that. How do you see the situation unravelling over the next couple of months? It's difficult to predict. A lot of decisions that have been made don't seem realistic and they don't seem reasonable. Um, but they're still, the, the owners still own the club, they make a lot of the major decisions and if they want to engage again with the supporters then I'm, I'm sure that we could try that facility but as each, as each week goes by it's getting more and more difficult and the gap is growing significantly.
Next, we will be getting an insight into why Venkis purchased Blackburn Rovers and why they made their decision to appoint Steve Keane as manager. As I understand it, I mean, they, they have had involvement in sports, that's a fact, for a number of years in India, sponsoring tennis, cricket, individuals. Uh, Balaji was particularly interested in football and I think they were considering buying a football club in India um, and while taking advice about what the next move was they were advised that you know if you want to buy a football club why not just go for the best most popular league in the world and go for the Premier League. Well the big idea was to buy a football club and get a fair bit of publicity out of it because the Premier League is a worldwide brand uh, and Blackburn Rovers were reasonably priced, so it all made a great deal of sense to them. They've got a poultry business in India, and they're um, uh, the kind of dominant market force in Indian poultry. But obviously, a poultry company in India and a football club in England are very different things. Um, they've had no experience of running a football club. Uh, they are remote physically from Blackburn. They've, obviously, they don't live here. They've visited uh, sporadically and, and particularly rarely recently, um, so they don't have experience of the particular industry. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of been all kinds of problems, communication problems, structural problems, lack of knowledge about the industry problems, uh, umpteen different reasons why things have gone the way they have. There was this idea of bringing in young players, selling them on, paying for everything, which in principle was very good, um, but as we know, along the way, it's lost its uh, its appeal and it's gone. Wrong. And when they sacked Sam Allardyce, I guess at, at that point, I suppose my assumption, like many people's, was that they knew what they were doing in terms of would have expert knowledge or have taken expert advice about getting rid of an experienced manager and bringing in a guy who hadn't managed in his own right before. Steve Keane stumbled into the job in many ways. I mean, when they first came in, there was talk about Diego Maradona coming in, which was fortunately nipped in the bud, and Steve Keane was there, uh, and very quickly. Uh, and smartly, so that the person to deal with to get things done was Mrs. Desai, uh, the owner, and ultimately the most sensible person within Venkis. There's a whole range of issues now about how Steve Keane actually got that job, um, who recommended him, who drew up his contract, um, um, you know, why was he picked above other people, who else is involved in him and in and around him that influenced the owners. You know, they, they are not experienced football people. So they were obviously taking advice. Why did they take advice? Who from? How much did they pay for that advice? A whole range of questions around the appointment of Steve Keane that fans legitimately are asking. If it was down to the fans, he'd be out. If it was down to the people who worked at the club, as we know, sending emails around, he'd be out. Uh, even members of the Venkis um, hierarchy themselves would like him out. However, uh, Mrs Desai, in her wisdom, thinks he's the right guy for the job and he's kept that contact all the way through and it's been a vital contact. I mean, last year when he wanted a new contract and he wasn't getting it, one telephone call to Mrs Desai, he's got a new contract. Any other coach having these kind of results would have been sacked quite a long time ago. Paul Agnew has been Steve Keane's ally uh, from the start, which is not a bad thing. I mean, you want your press officer uh, to be your, your right hand man and stand up for you. Um, I've got no problems with Paul Agnew. I mean, we've had our ups and downs in the past, but I do see the guy's loyal. I do see he stood by Steve Keane. And if Steve Keane wants somebody in there that he can trust, then that guy's Paul Agnew. Now, the fans might not like Paul Agnew, but let's face it, the fans don't really like anything about the current regime. If Paul Agnew helps Steve Keane and the club starts winning matches, then nobody's going to care about Paul Agnew down the line. Paul Agnew's company was bought in to kind of give Blackburn a press setup that they didn't have, but it was always a separate external entity. So Paul Agnew has worked in and around Blackburn for a long time and knew the old guard and, and um, uh, you know, and knows the club. In terms of his relationship with Steve Keane, I think once, he, once Paul Agnew saw that Steve Keane was the owner's choice, um, he you know, appears to me to be, again, a pragmatic guy who sees how things, the way the wind's blowing and, and he is going to be supportive of a manager that, that the owners are supportive of. In terms of their relationship, I mean, he's just done everything he can to support Steve Keane. In terms of what his role is now, Paul Agnew's new role, you know, I don't know. I don't know if he knows. I don't know if um, quite what the dynamic is going to be in this new setup because there's been so many changes at, at, at board level and at kind of key 
managerial positions within that club over the last 18 months. I'm not quite sure who is going to be doing what. And Steve Keane's realised, well, I've got somebody who's having my back here. So uh, on his recommendation, I'm pretty sure Paul Agnew has got a senior role now at the club. With the club in decline, former players who once graced the Rovers shirt have come forward to express their concerns. Obviously it's not gone well, you know, and when you look at it from the viewpoint of supporters who more than 12 months ago now were, were showing concern about the way the club was being run and, and the whole organisation uh, and then at the end of the season to see everything that uh, they were worried about come to fruition um, obviously confirmed their worst fears. For some reason, been known perhaps only to them, they haven't really communicated, you know, that they're, they're, they're obviously very wealthy people, a wealthy family, uh, multi-businesses, uh, they're bringing a huge amount of money, um, but this is perhaps like a business like no other really, that, that, that if you come and take a, a club in this way, you, you know, we're, we're not Manchester United, it's Blackburn Rovers, it's, it really is a big thing about the community, you know, it's, a, it's about people's lives and, and a lot of people put a lot of store in the club, you know, the club and the community go hand in hand. The problem I've got with the Venkies is that they don't communicate with the fans. I mean, for all the time they was there, when they first came into the club, they're going to say, we're going to be in Europe, we're going to do this, be Premiership champions. And I don't think they really understood the football in the Premiership. I think um, they thought it was going to be easy, put their own man in as manager, their own choice and then sort it from that but um, the main problem is the communication with the fans. Their only crime in inverted commas is one of naivety and I think if they were more open and more visible and more accessible I think it would it wouldn't take away the fact the team underperformed but it would at least make people be more sympathetic towards them. The fact that they haven't really communicated it, 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 it's been done poorly, especially when you think of the money's involved. It, it perhaps wouldn't have taken too much for them to, to work with a PR person to, to, to come and talk to the community, but that really hasn't happened. And I've got to say, that's incredibly disappointing. I think the big question is, is why new owners would come in and really you know, look to make decisions that look to be counterproductive for the club doing well. With the structure of the club that seemed to be good. We want uh, more open communication. There's been letters and uh, communication sent into the owners that I know where they've been totally ignored. Now, when all the television money's gone, when everything's stripped down, that football club belongs to the supporters. It's the season ticket uh, holders who provide the income to keep that football club going once the television money's gone. And that television money will only last a certain length of time whilst they get the parachute payments. And they can see, obviously, uh, the demise of the football club. And, and, and they weren't happy with the way things were being run. And, of course, they've tried to express their opinions. But even major sponsors in the football club who put an awful lot of money into it uh, have been totally ignored. And all the fans' fears have been um, uh, come to fruition at the end of the day. Yeah, I think they need to improve their PR. OK, they're mostly in India. Um, I think they've appointed someone now and I think he should be better at communicating with the fans because, that, like I keep saying, that is what they do need to do. Appoint somebody who's going to be the spokesperson for them and say what they're saying. The fans might not like it, the fans might like it, but they've got to have somebody who will speak for the bankers and say what their intentions are at the football club. Unfortunately, the man Venkis brought in was Chevy Singh. The Malaysian football pundit entered the Ewood Park doors in the summer of 2012 as the voice of the Venkis, under the title Global Advisor. He has since managed to upset players, managers and fellow ballroom members and the majority of the Blackburn Rovers fanbase. He has become renowned for his foolish comments to the media and has become a PR disaster. I had the pleasure of speaking to Chevy a few weeks after he started working in his new role at the football club. Chevy, how long have you known the Rao family for? Um, I first came uh, in contact with the Rao family in uh, July 2011, uh, where I was uh, invited to Pune to meet uh, Madam, Mr. Venki and Mr. Balaji. 
and uh, subsequently on my visit there uh, we had discussions and uh, we uh, discussed a lot about you know how to brand promote and market Blackburn Rovers in Asia and uh, and uh, I was asked you know uh, if I would like to take on that challenge uh, which I accepted uh, gratefully so since August uh, 2011 I have been under the employment of uh, the Venkis. How long um, how do you think the Venkis have fared so far? Uh, well, I think, you know, I think uh, on their part, uh, as owners of a club, I think they've been very, very supportive. Uh, I think uh, they have been very cooperative as well. Um, unfortunately, uh, the club has been relegated, got relegated. So uh, what they have done uh, for the club, uh, I think, um, has gone uh, unnoticed rather. Uh, because you know, owners are always going to be judged on the club moving forward or, or being successful, but there can there can be a, a time in, in you know in the the lifespan of a club or a situation at the club you know where I think they possibly got in uh, at the wrong time because when you look at the the, the playing side of it you know I, I think and, and, and I've you know I'm, I'm a student of the game and, and I think you know they might just have caught the club on the downward curve uh, and uh, subsequently you know, uh, relegation happened. Uh, so I would say at this moment in time, you know, I think th they have been judged, but in my opinion, unfairly. And as with every cycle, you know, I think now we're on the way up again. Do you think they made the right call in appointing Steve Keane as manager? Uh, well, obviously, you know, results say no. You no, know? results say no. So I think that is the answer. So, but, Having said that, you know, and, and I have been, you know, uh, uh, one of Steve's biggest critics on television in my job as a football pundit, you know, uh, uh, and um, I think the situation, obviously, you know, with coupled with, you know, uh, the fact that there were too many players uh, who possibly didn't give enough, you know, big name players who just thought about themselves, didn't want to sacrifice for the club, they wanted out, they wanted this, you know, there was too much turmoil. And I think, you know, once again, as with the Venkis possibly coming into ownership at the wrong time, I think Steve walked into uh, uh, the, the job at the wrong time. But as a person, as a person, I've always enjoyed my conversations uh, with Steve about football. And, you know, God willing now, you know, I am in a position where we can actually converse about football, we can actually discuss football and the way forward together. Why do you think he is still in the job? Because you said, obviously, the results is the most important thing and they haven't really given, yeah, they've been relegated. I think, I think yeah, I think, you know, um, again, you know, the, the, the Premier League is built on this sack the manager uh, culture, so much so that the fans, you know, be, become, uh, be, be, become very, very vocal as well. And really, you cannot excuse that with the, the, the poor results, right? But I, I think, you know, I think, uh, what um, my bosses have done, you know, is to say, look, we will try, you know, to, to instill some form of continuity because you look at the great manager, Sir Alex Ferguson was almost on the brink, uh, right? You know, there have been many managers who have been on the brink, have been, have been able to rescue themselves. Uh, and uh, Steve is well respected as a coach. As, as a coach, you know, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people. I mean, what he does on the training ground is, is really, really very, very good. And uh, just possibly, you know, like I said, you know, um, right job at the wrong time. But again, everybody for me, you know, deserves uh, another chance, a second chance. Uh, but from now on, from now on, I would say, you know, uh, Steve uh, uh, has got a better team around him. The club has got a better structure uh, in there. And, and I think what happened, yes, you, know, um, you don't forget the past. The yes. wounds will heal, the scars will remain. But I think this is a new season. And I think, you know, Steve uh, is being given the benefit of the doubt. Um, as you said, he's moving forward and restructuring um, the appointment of Paul Agnew. Now, this hasn't gone down too well with the fans. Would you have any reason as to why well, that wouldn't have gone I, down well with the fans? I would say, you know, I don't really know Paul that well. Uh, you know, I'm new here, I, I'm new into the situation, even though I have a, a, a relationship with the Vankies dating to last year. Uh, there, there are certain roles to be filled in the, in the structure of a football club. And, 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 and in filling those roles, you know, Paul is uh, in that, filling a role. 
uh, you know, uh, Derek Shaw has come in as the uh, MD to fill a role because with different roles, there are different responsibilities. You know, like for example, you know, there's football league meetings to go to, uh, you know, football league committees uh, to, 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 to sit on. And so, so these are the requirements that need to be filled. I think one of the question marks was over how Paul Agnew actually got the job because um, Steve Keane relied absolutely heavily on him for his PR and his press and everyone thinks it's a bit of a, a mate's deal. I think, yeah, I mean, you know, it's difficult, you know. People might turn around and say, oh yeah, you know, Shabby's in the job because, you know, he knows the Venkis or Shabby's in the job because he's Indian. I mean, what can I say, Rishi, to, 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 to dispel that, you know, so people have their uh, perceptions, you know, and so be it, you know. I think it's because he might be unproven in this role, whereas Steve Keane was obviously unproven as a manager. And from what it seems at the moment, it seems to have failed and they got relegated. They brought in another unproven person in another role. And I think that's possibly where the eyebrows have been raised. Uh, I think once again, you know, the benefit of the doubt. I think, you know, that, that, is, the, that is the best way to explain the situation. You know, you, 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 you know, you either go out there and you get somebody who's been in that kind of a job, you know, for, 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 for years and years, or you say, look, you know, somebody is going to step up and hopefully, you know, he's going to step into a position and hopefully, you know, he steps up in that position. So I think the benefit of the doubt, once again, you know, uh, is, is applied here. What does the future hold for Blackburn? What, how can it move forward from having such a, a downward spiral so how, far? I mean, this is again, you know, I, I, I believe, you know, in cycles, you know, and I believe and, and I have to say that, you know, otherwise I, I would not have accepted the responsibility that there is the time. I mean, you hit rock bottom and, and I think Blackburn Rovers have, you know, and there's only one way to go and that's, you know, uh, go up. And, and I believe that with my experience, you know, with, with my uh, expertise, with my knowledge that, you know, I can help, you know, build a club not just build a team but i think i can help build a club and and uh, and, and i believe in my my ability and i believe you know that um, having spoken to the fans i believe the fans uh, are difficult to convince because at the end of the day it's what happens on, on this you know patch of green that is going to be important but i want to try you know uh, to to Get, give them a team to get excited about, players to get excited about and you know for, for Steve the responsibility is to make sure that you know the results are forthcoming. Do you, do you firmly believe hand on heart that Steve King is the manager to take this club forwards? Well like I said you know the benefit of the doubt you know is, has been given to Steve you know and now I, I like to think I like to believe you know that Steve can, can look uh, upon me as, as a sounding board, you know, uh, look upon me as someone who can provide the platform for him, uh, you know, to, to concentrate on what matters, that is the, the performance uh, of the team. So I, I would say I believe in my ability, you know, and I believe I can be of help to Steve and I can be of help to the club. How would you describe Steve King's relationship with Mrs Desai? Uh, I have never met Steve um, in, in, in no, I met I, I, I well, I've met uh, Madam and Steve once. That was uh, that was uh, in the at the end of May, end of May, uh, where where we all met together in in Pune, and um, I, I think you know the relationship is that you know you are the manager, you are responsible for certain uh, aspects of the team, you know, and uh, you know that has not been good enough. So uh, Madam is very firm. If, if I may say so, she's very, very firm. I mean, she, she, she knows uh, what decisions need to be made and, and she makes them. I mean, she's not, you know, chairperson of, of, of a major uh, group of, of companies in, in India, you know. So I think, you know, the past one year, past 18 months has, has been uh, an eye-opener for her. But I, I can safely say that, you know, the 18 months that have been, have, have made her... Uh, a more focused person on football matters and I think she's, she, has, she has now begun to understand and, and uh, I, I must share this with you, the funny thing is that you know, I was told that Madam never once missed Monday Night Football on ESPN because that's a one hour talk show where I can be at my brutal best. <laughs> so, so I hope that you know, I think it's been part of education as well, you know, so, so I would say honestly don't mess around with Madam. In, in English football terms, Steve Keane, obviously the results haven't been well on the pitch, but also there's this uh, image that he is harming Blackburn Rose uh, re 
image in, in general with the, in newspapers and journalism, um, whereby, um, you know, with the drink driving case and also with this new lawsuit with Sam Allardyce, both things aren't adding up uh, as to a, what can be a successful manager to take the clubs forward. Yeah, I think, you know, everybody makes mistakes. I, I think, you know, you know, maybe there might be one or two skeletons in everybody's cupboard, you know. Unfortunately for Steve, you know, everything's just come out in the open uh, together and, and the pressure has mounted on him and uh, the results are not forthcoming. The fans have, uh, have uh, voiced th th their concerns and everything. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I think, you know, what doesn't uh, kill him will make him stronger. In October 2011, a group of Blackburn fans were invited by Venkis to spend time with them in Pune, India. Two members of the group talk us through their trip. Uh, basically, I'm on the fans forum at the club and we received an email from the secretary, John, um, advising us that Venkis wanted some of the fans to come out to India to see the work that they did um, and that there were 10 fans to go out there to be selected from the fans forum to go out. So that's basically how the, the trip came about. We were treated almost like royalty. Um, in, uh, as part of the uh, whole Rovers party, including the team. We, we had a grand reception when we got there. There were security followers everywhere we went. We, we couldn't really go out of the hotel without having a security detachment with us. We had a meeting with Balaji that maybe lasted for about an hour um, after a bit of to and of rowing. And the brief summary of the meeting was that they were in the club for the long run. They wanted the very best for the club. and. Whatever happens, we won't go down there with actually his words. We would do whatever we needed to do, and there would be a plan B if required, which obviously didn't come to fruition. Uh, with Balaji, uh, we did get to sit down for about an hour or so and talk uh, fairly open and frankly about uh, our concerns for where the club was going and what was happening and uh, uh, whether we had the right manager in the club. Uh, he, he certainly gave us some assurances that uh, nobody was sackable in his opinion. Um, but. Nothing has happened since then. So. so basically, like I said, there was 10 people from the fans forum, the wide cross-section of people who were voted for by the other members of the fans forum. Um, and then there was four uh, gentlemen who went off their own back. They paid for the flights to India, transport down from Mumbai down to Pune, and the hotel stay, etc. Um, but they just went uh, literally for the match because they got to all the matches. <laughs> I think what, what we perhaps didn't fully understand when we were out in October was the the operating model that the family use and it, my understanding is that Mr. Desai is the person who has sole control and is the sole person who makes decisions and that the two brothers while they're, they're heavily involved in the business and Balaji in particular in the football business um, he doesn't have the ultimate power to do anything so he's, it's not within his realm to make changes such as replacing the manager. On the last evening there was sort of like a, a social gathering um, there was the larger was there, Mr. Venkley was there, Mrs. Desai was there, and the players and the manager, etc. And uh, it was then that the larger said to Purdy and uh, the other uh, fellows that were there that they would get their flights and money refunded. Which were, and then we came back, and we, uh, when we landed at Manchester Airport, there was a big double spread in the Daily Mirror about them um, like getting the money back, and they never did. So I, I do believe genuinely that um, Balaji, I think it was Balaji's idea. It was a genuine attempt by Balaji to, to start to have a relationship with fans. Uh, and I think it was, that was genuine. I, I just think that actually he's not got the power to be able to deliver what the fans have clearly wanted for, for the last six to nine months. Now I think it was just a PR stunt to show us this is the temple that, uh, that we've like, built, this is all the people that we feed, this is the work that we do, and they took us around the factories and everything, which was all sort of, you know, very, very good. But at the end of the day, all we're bothered about is the club and any investment that they can make into the club and the management structures that they've got or that they haven't got now within the club. There seems to be a problem with the communication at the club. This is about as good as it gets, the trip to Pune. Mm -hmm. So is there a case of when they do speak, people end up coming out saying that it's lies so do you think that's why they might refrain from speaking? Possibly. Um, I think there's probably a lot more going on in, in terms of the PR within the club. They've been told, well, it's my understanding, they've been told not to say anything now, really. To a large, to a large degree, what happens at a football club depends on results. If the team loses, everybody gets down, the whole community gets down, and people start to look for reasons to make change. And, and, and 
as time's gone on, it, it started with a campaign against Keane. It's, it's widened into a general disillusionment with Benkis as owners as well. But as I say, if, if they were to change quickly, uh, then that, that move would change quickly too. Next, I speak to two senior members of the local councils who express their disappointments at the creation of a divide between the supporters and their football club. Before it became fashionable to, to write to the Venkis, in about May or June last year, I wrote them a letter saying they, were just, they just seemed to be distancing themselves from... This isn't just a, a football team, it's a club and it's a club in a town, it's a club in a community. And I was trying to get them to understand that and offered to, offer to act as some kind of um, ambassador or bridge between them and the communities. Uh, I got no reply to that. Uh, I've written in the last two or three weeks, perhaps two months, and I got the same answer, nothing. So um, they don't seem very much like they're into communicating with people. I spoke to many fans um, of years and years of stand being supporters of Blackburn Rovers who just said they wouldn't renew season tickets until something was done about the then uh, current management um, and until certain individuals left the club they'd never set fo foot inside the ground again which is really really disappointing because the club means so much to so many people it's not just about results um, the club's part of the town um, they People in Blackburn are proud of their club. The football team isn't just a football team. Uh, it's one of the oldest and one of the, um, the founders of the Football League and of the Premiership, I was reading earlier. Um, but people in Blackburn and Darwin say what they think. And uh, I guess they don't think much of how things are operating at the moment. Anybody who works for any company knows if a new owner come in, new management, whatever, they tend to want to put their own people in. Uh, that's not unusual, but I think somebody who's coming into football or owners coming in would want to at least keep some consistency uh, for a period of time. So I'm not quite sure whether it's the owners who've been naive on this or whether there's somebody else advising them who's badly advising them for whatever reasons. Um, may be beneficial to them. Uh, initially they had a guy called Paul Hunt who uh, I was invited to go and see. He was a deputy chief executive to no chief executive so I don't know who he was deputy to. Uh, he was a nice guy, uh, quite an honourable sort of a fellow, quite informative, quite open. Um, but as you may know, uh, one Tuesday morning a few weeks ago he just kind of disappeared into the uh, ether and wasn't to be seen again because a, a letter was published that he'd written to the Venkis. I mean, uh, the, the deputy chief exec uh, resorting to writing to his employers. Um, I don't think he got a reply, but um, he got his cards, and that was the end of that. I think it was then when results weren't going too well, and Steve Keane was given a contract. That then seemed strange to Rovers supporters, and then a contract extended. I think if somebody had said, "Well, we'll try it for a few months and see how it goes," uh, but if you're not measuring up to the job then we'll, we'll have to make other arrangements but there were plenty of candidates about who would have done an excellent job for Blackburn Rovers um, so I think it was a surprise and puzzlement that's the best I'll put it to um, fans. The main two guys I guess who went uh, initially were ironically the guys who brought the Venkis in um, John Williams and Tom Finn who I've known over a number of years and when they both finished, I wrote to them saying, you've done a great job for this club. And they did do a wonderful job. Uh, Blackburn Rovers punches above its weight. Uh, it's a small town. Uh, we don't really deserve to be a, a Premiership successful team, but we were for many, many years. And so those two guys uh, were central to the trading in of the Venkis. And then they kind of uh, got their, got their um, thank yous and goodbyes. And a number of other people, John Newsom well respected in the local community as in charge of um, um, security and the, uh, the stewards and stuff like that. 
he just disappeared. And so all these kind of um, almost like um, pieces of furniture, part of the family at Ewood Park, have uh, just disappeared. And people don't really like it, I think. people. This is quite um, an oral kind of community where people chat with each other. And uh, I don't think the chat's very good at the moment. I took an afternoon out during the filming of the documentary to visit the gravestone of Blackburn Rovers founder, John Lewis. In April 2008, ex-chairman John Williams made it his duty to restore the grave of John Lewis, as he had become aware it was totally overgrown. Williams stated, the man is such a big part of our history and it's important for clubs to keep track of their roots. However, once I found the gravestone, I was astonished and saddened to find that it had been left untouched for months. This for me demonstrated how much Venkis care for the heritage of this football club. I'm not sure they would even know who John Lewis is. The MP of Heslingdon and Hindburn, Graham Jones, has had meetings with footballing authorities in an attempt to raise the awareness of the ongoings at Blackburn Rovers. Um, Graham, how do you think the Venkis have fared so far since their takeover of Blackburn Rovers? Well, badly, very badly. Um, they've run the club into the ground from being one of the best run clubs in the Premier League. We're now in the Championship and probably the worst run club in the Championship if not in the Football League. Why do you think they uh, appointed Steve Keane after sacking Allardyce very early into their reign, appointing someone, an unknown manager really, um, into such a big role? Well, I'm taking a, a, an observation that they don't really know a lot about football and they've taken advice from Jerome Anderson and of course Jerome Anderson, um, Steve Keane is a client of Jerome Anderson and I believe that that is the connection that led to Steve Keane getting the, um, getting the job. Um, you've shown great support towards the um, BRFC Action Group and um, with Glenn Mullen and you attended the Sports Minister meeting. Could you tell me a little bit about um, in general why you're supporting the group and how the meeting went? Well, I just thought up to Christmas uh, the supporters were getting such a bad name and it was unjustified. I mean, at the end of the day, they argued that the club would be relegated, that um, the, uh, the, the, the mess at the club was, was severe uh, and there were lots of problems and they were right. And there seemed to be a, a media narrative, both in newsprint and uh, television, that, uh, that was saying the opposite, that the fans were the problem and if they only backed Steve Keane, um, Rovers would be a successful club and it was just nonsense and the fans were being painted as as the problem in this uh, in, in Blackburn Rovers is uh, walls. Um, something quite interesting came out in the Evening Standard the other day um, the new Reading owner he said that his takeover was held up by the Premier League asking questions about an agent's involvement in a takeover do you think that the meetings with the Premier League with Scudamore have helped for future clubs I think they've built up the pressure. Um, I'm not so sure whether the Premier League aren't just burying their head in the sand. Uh, there's a suggestion that the Premier League are looking into this and they just can't find um, the smoking gun, the evidence, uh, and that's what's holding up um, an inquiry. Um, so we'll have to wait and see um, what the outcome will be. But I'm, I'm positive that it has moved forward, that at least the FA have been um, told of the issue. I've wrote to them personally twice. Um, to ask for advice on some of the issues that have been put in the public domain, the two letters from Paul Hunt and from John Williams, which have indicated third party involvement in the club. So we'll just have to wait and see. Um, the bottom line is I'm not confident that anything will come out of it if, as far as Blackburn Rovers is, is concerned, although the meeting with the sports minister, that should uh, again uh, press the FA um, on certain matters involving third party third parties, not just in transfer dealings and activities at the club, um, but also in terms of the director's role and company law, and also um, in terms of the beneficial shareholders, because at the moment it's 25% by each of the Venkis family members. But there's a question of actually if there's a beneficial shareholder behind, behind that. Um, do you think that with the meetings with the FA, the sports minister, the Premier League, um, it will be a case of, unfortunately Blackburn won't come out of it um, well, but future clubs in the thing, um, investigations into future takeovers etc, they'll come out of it well. 
Well, the sports minister is keen to resolve this matter. You've got issues at Coventry where the owner um, isn't known, um, issues at Portsmouth which are well documented, and the previous issues with the American owners at Manchester United and the leveraging of debt and also at Liverpool, and problems at other clubs as well. So I think that the sports minister is keen that something's done to protect what is a, a, a big industry for, for, for the UK. Um, it puts us on the map as a, as a nation. Uh, the FA Premier League is the uh, most popular league in the world. So I think the sports minister is cl uh, clear that he wants to see better arrangements for governance so that such malpractice or poor practice um, doesn't bring the game into disrepute in the UK. How have you seen changes in the community since the Venkis have taken over and the fans have reacted badly to their decisions? Well, I think the fans have, have behaved very well. I mean, um, there's, to my uh, knowledge, there's been no public order uh, arrests uh, despite all the protests, and that's a credit to the fans and to the organisers. I think that everything that's been done has been peaceful. When I spoke with Paul Hunt, then it was all done through the club as well, as well as through the police. So I think the fans have behaved uh, uh, well. I think some of the comments by um, David Moyes and football managers that are sympathetic to Steve Keane, I think that's the old boys club. I don't think there's, uh, the, they really understand what's going on. They're just defending one of uh, what, you know, a fellow manager. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and so I think the fans have behaved tremendously well. Um, and I think that the protests will continue. Um. How do you see the situation unravelling now, um, in the next coming months? Um, I think it will deteriorate. Uh, the club have to bounce back. It's all about winning matches. I mean, I don't think people will ever forgive Steve Keane, but they may leave him alone if he becomes a winning manager. Um, I th we'll certainly leave the Venkis alone if we become a winning team and a winning club and a better run club and we start to move up the league table, get promoted back into the Premier League and survive in the Premier League. But I think anything less will just um, create um, ongoing problems. The BRFC Action Group have been investigating the lack of transparency at the football club. I approached them to ask how they got together and what they have found out so far. Originally when the protest started in September I went down and uh, attended the first protest. I got in touch with Glenn a few days after that to discuss what we were going to do the week after. And Ever since then, I've spent obviously a lot of time at home with them. I got involved in planning and organising protest, and then this was pre the action group. When the action group were born, it became a group. Obviously, when we put everybody forward for election, and I stood then and I got elected. And ever since then, I've been properly involved. I've been to every, you know, I've attended everything that there is to attend, and it's just something that I always thought that was right. And obviously, when from the very first protest about what Glen were doing, so I just put myself forward and got involved, and it went from there. I was delighted when I went in to see the sports minister. Uh, it was quite overwhelming uh, to go, obviously, with the three MPs, Jack Straw, Jake Berry and Graham Jones. Uh, the sports minister was very, very accommodating when we went in. In fairness, he was in awe of Jack Straw. It was a major ally taking Jack with us. Um, he took our concerns very, very seriously. He was looking at how football can be regulated. If that needs to be self-regulated by the Premier League or an external body brought in and it's something which before he went into office he was keen to implement and obviously with the situation that we've taken to him now and obviously with Jack inputs, it's something that they're now going to try and push to implement. I've actually attended the protest right from the very first one, uh, both myself and my son. Um, we tagged on to the first one to see what it, what it were actually. When the protest started taking, you know, the marches and everything came about, uh, I, then I joined on. Uh, I was voted onto the committee in January of this year and I've been active, actively involved since then. So um, you, then you met the FA the day after, how did that go? I was went to the FA the day after and um, you know I've got to thank uh, Mr Scudamore for that as well because we advanced that meeting and we was in there with the compliance officer of the FA and also the compliance officer of the agents which uh, was a bit surprised he was there but we was quite glad he was there due to the content of the information that was given him and obviously about the information about Jerome Anderson and his links with Blackburn Rovers. I've been involved uh, ever since the first protest against Arsenal last year when I joined the first protest march and then um, I was asked to join the group, um, went to a meeting at Ewood um, 
and then I was elected onto the committee at the annual general meeting. You handed over a 400 page dossier. Are you allowed to reveal anything that was inside that? Basically the dossier, the, the stuff that, uh, that was in there, it was uh, a lot of testimonies from employees at the club. Um, it was quite a very good testimony from the council guard or who discussed um, Jerome Manderson's involvement in October of last year and what he was actually offering people like himself, Ryan Nelson, Jason Roberts, Brett Everton, Keith Andrews, offering 80 percent of the contracts to leave the club. And I asked uh, Mikhail Sagada what was the reason for this, and he said it was all commissions for Jerome and all commissions. And, and um, one of the statements we had from the club was about um, Jerome and Steve Keane actually taking large commissions from uh, transfers that was coming into the club. So a lot of the information that we gave to the FA and the Premier League was resolving around shadow directorship and uh, obviously third party involvement which um, we feel is unethical. Well it concerns me, it's concerned me long before, a lot before the first protest, the way things were going concern me. I mean we narrowly avoided relegation the year before, so that so it was very apparent from very early that Steve Keane wasn't the right man and that's how it begun. And the, the backing of Steve Keane then became an issue and as we started to look into the owners and investigate what they were doing and as the supporters asked, asked for help and they, co they completely disregarded what the supporters wanted to do, it then became more apparent that it was going to be about them because not about Steve Keane. And obviously the more we've looked into things, the more concerned we've become. Something was sparked up in the recent Reading owner who had just taken over. He said that he felt that Scudamore held up his takeover of Reading um, due to the situation at Blackburn. Does that make you feel good, as though you've now done something that could possibly be set in stone for future takeovers? Well, yeah, uh, Mr Scudamore was quite clear when we had a conversation. His own words, he called Blackburn was a basket case. And um, we all, our supporters, know it's a basket case. It doesn't make us feel any better. And obviously the Premier League have highlighted it as a basket case, but it's what actions they take now, not just you know, for Blackburn Rovers, but for other football clubs too, to make sure you know, what happens at Blackburn doesn't happen at other clubs. Um, obviously we've been relegated. Fans can handle relegation, teams have got to go up, teams have got to go down. It's the way it's happened and the lack of communication, obviously the third party involvement. We've been promised that if, if, if anything is found, uh, it'll be investigated. Um, regarding our concerns about the ownership of the club, the way it's run, everything. Hopefully, um, behind, this, the, you know, behind the scenes, um, people are making changes within the club if there's any wrongdoing. We've worked very, very hard actually, because there's been a, a division on the terraces involving the supporters. Um, we've got little like skirmishes and a few scuffles here and there involving their own supporters, which was, I've never ever known this in 42 years of being a Blackburn supporter. I've never seen it on the terraces. I've seen away supporters fighting, but never our own fans, no. What do you think's put that on? Um, Venkis, Steve Keane, it's what they've actually come in and promised the supporters. They've never delivered. Steve Keane comes out with constant lies. Um, People say give Steve Keane a chance, give him a chance. No, we did, you know, all season. And the Bolton game at home was probably the final straw for me. Do you think there's time for the Venkis to rectify themselves? It's, it's all a very confusing at the moment. Since we've had the meeting for the Premier League and the FA, we've now got our third board of directors in 18 months. That's unheard of at any football club. But, you know, that can't be dusted under the carpet. There's been a lot of changes at Blackburn Rovers since these meetings have taken place. Now, I don't know if this is because of the meetings have taken place or this was always going to happen, you know, but it's too early in the day to say if these are good moves by the club or bad moves. But for clarification, we need to know who the beneficial owners are at Blackburn Rovers, who's calling the shots and why manager Steve Keane has outlasted about 15 different directors now and he still seems to be the man who's untappable. Having got meetings with the Premier League and the um, FA, Football League meeting to come, we are being taken seriously by these organisations and that's got to be good for the cause really. Do you think he's unsackable because it's Steve Keane's way or the door? Yeah, so obviously talking to ex-employees who have left the club, you know, I've spoken with Paul Hunt, I've spoken with John Newsham, these individuals who, you know, have got friendly with all the 
the last few months and that. And you know, they quite openly said that Steve Keen has his hit list. You know, their names are on the hit list, and obviously they've left the club. If a manager's got more power than a director, then it's, it, uh, it points to shadow directorship. And shadow directorship in um, the UK is illegal because directors are accountable for everything that happens at a football club. And if somebody's making the decisions who isn't registered as a director and if somebody else is accountable for it, then again, like I said, it's unethical, it's not right, and it's something should be done about it. I think originally the Richard Scooter more meeting, I think he thought that we were just going to turn up and mourn that we'd gone down. And it became very apparent very quickly from the off that we'd come and we were serious and we had stuff that we wanted to share with them. And we put across what we wanted to and he listened and his pen never stopped and he wrote down what we wanted to say. And it was the same when it, it got to the point where he then accelerated the FA meeting and organised that I'll be off and went down there and we met obviously important people from the compliance team and they took on board what we were saying and they made it clear that we weren't the first people I'd be spoken to. Uh, the Premier the, so the Premier League and the FA meetings went good. Obviously the FA come out and issued a statement afterwards saying that they was going to uh, investigate what we'd looked into. The Sports Minister meeting were currently compiling uh, his request, a list of questions that he, he can then take himself to the governing bodies and ask them on our behalf. So I think they all went well, they were all willing to work with us and see where we can get because all we want is cl clarification and some transparency about what's going on. Why did someone like John Newsham leave the football club? Um, speaking to John, um, John is the best in the business. He's not only had 26 years at Blackburn Rovers as a health and safety manager, I know he's not everybody's cup of tea, but his job is to keep people safe. But he's also the chair of all the health and safety officers of all the Premier League clubs. He's the top of the food chain. And um, I had a conversation with John. Um, he was very fearful that he was on Steve Keane's list. John stated that, you know, he would like to do another five years. He was up, coming up for retirement. But he said if certain individuals was removed from the club, he'd be willing to do another five years. Um, there was a tale of um, Paul Agnew actually saying that he'd done Steve Keane out down the microphone. That had been passed on to Steve Keane, who had then passed it on to the owners in India. And ultimately, John Newsham's lost his job. Uh, I think it's a crying shame that somebody who's put so many years into Blackburn Rovers can just be cast away. And when all he's done over the last 12 months is try and be that goal between, between supporters and club, which other people are support, should have been doing. So um, it's a sad time that John's gone. Who's head of health and security now? We don't have anybody. Uh, obviously, Stuart Cayley, who was John Newsham's right hand man, will probably be doing the role in the interim. There's rumours that Steve Keane's bodyguard has been interview interviewed for the role. Um, th but at the moment, there's been no announcement from the club, so everybody's pretty much in the dark. So, how do you think that Steve King will fare in a championship? Well, he's won 13 matches. So let's not mass this. Blackburn Rovers, you know, have been relegated. You know, there's Nuno Gomez has come in now. Leon Best, Danny Murphy. Now, a lot of sports say, oh, great, great signings. But let's not forget, we've lost Yakubu. Robinson's going out the door. We've lost Hoylet. And 18 months ago, we was a Premier League football club, top 10, nice and safe. Now we're in the championship, and the championship, you know, we've been in that division before. Uh, before Jack Walker came, we tried many, many years to get out of it. It's one of the hardest leagues to get out of. And yes, bring three or four players in, nothing wrong with that. But I think a lot will depend on who actually leaves. And there's many players at Blackburn Rovers who have left in the past and will continue to leave due to the manager, which is Steve King. Ding done sackable by Mrs. Defay, sorry, Desai. Um, do you think that Shebby Singh has more power? to possibly sack him if results don't go his way? I think the only person that can sack Steve Keane is um, either Steve Keane himself or um, obviously this is the say. Um, Shebby hasn't got the power to sack anybody. Obviously he's the eyes and ears of uh, Venkis, this is what he said. So we have to look at him as if he's the owner and he'll be the direct link back to the owners. But again, he'll just give lip service, you know, and like Paul Hunt did in his leak letter, by other employees, every, every employer that has gone against Steve Keane has lost their job. You know, so it all depends on the relationship Shebby has with Mr. Desai to the relationship Steve Keane has with him. How close are we to a conclusion to all this mess? It's, I don't think we're any closer. You know, we've obviously we've had new directors come in. It looks good on the outside. You know, there's a rumour that Maurice Watkins might be coming in from Manchester United, who um, he's had 28 years' experience there. We've brought in. That's Vesta, the ex-Liverpool uh, secretary. It all looks good from the outside world to put in an infrastructure together. Uh, but obviously we've also got 
a lot of Steve Keane's men in there, Paul Agnew, um, who him and Steve have been hand in hand um, throughout Steve's reign. Um, obviously Paul Agnew's brought Derek Shaw in, who's again his friend, so again there seems to be more Steve Keane allies going in there. So there is going to be quite a bit of infighting in that board. There's already leaks coming out of the club that there's a lot of friction between Chevy's arrival, where Paul Agnew thought he was going to be. So I think, you know, in that boardroom, it's going to be very, very interesting this season. But, you know, sadly, uh, the sister supporters are still none the wiser of what's actually going on in the club, and all they want is um, a bit of closure more than anything, you know, so that they can go down watching the team and start enjoying being a football fan again. continued ignorance displayed by the Rail family has made the problems worse for the club. With the club now being embarrassed in the High Courts, it is probably only a matter of time before the truth comes out. And by the truth, I mean the covered up ongoings that have taken place behind the scenes at the football club from the first day Venkis purchased Blackburn Rovers. <laughs>